Live from Brockton, Mass, it's the seasonal science stream, spring changes, weathering, erosion, and deposition. Welcome to the Seasonal Science Stream, our monthly broadcast of fun and interactive hands-on science components that work well with digital things from the Discovery Education Science Tech Book. My name is Patty Duncan and I'm from the Instructional Implementation Team of the Science Tech Book and I'm coming to you live from Brockton, Massachusetts from South Middle School. Say hi guys! Hi. Hi. So the students and I are here today to talk to you about a very specific topic. Our topic this month is called Spring Changes, Weathering Erosion and Deposition. Now we call it Spring Changes because typically in the spring, at least here in the Northeast where we are, we have a lot of rain. And so things that happen when you have a lot of rain, things get loosened up and moved around. And so there's a lot of this process of weathering erosion and deposition going on. But the fact of the matter is, is that weathering, erosion, and deposition happen all the time. They happen everywhere around the world. And it's a slow process in some places, and in others it's a quick process. So we're going to talk in general about some specific weathering, erosion, and deposition processes today. And just keep in mind that this stuff's ha happening everywhere and all the time. Alright, so the first thing we want to talk about is what do we mean when we say weathering? Lots of times people hear the word weathering and they think weather and they are kind of related because when you have severe weather you get more weathering. But weathering is a very specific term. So here are our essential questions on weathering. What does weathering mean and what are the main ways that weathering occurs? Those are our essential questions. So essentially, weathering means to break down. The entire Earth is made up of rock. In fact, when the Earth first formed, it was all rock. And slowly over time, that rock got broken down, and we got water, and we got the mountains and things that we see now. Now, when the Earth was formed, and on occasion, we have these big events like volcanoes and earthquakes and plates smashing into each other on the surface of the Earth that cause mountain change. And those are big changes to the surface of the Earth. But we're talking about weathering. We're talking about small changes over time, breaking down of the rock and wearing it away. One way that rock can be brought down and worn away is by water. We see this a lot. We see that rocks that are up against a cliff will have water banging up against them and they get smoothed out. This is a typical rock with rough edges that you might see. These rocks are what we call river stones. These are rocks that have been sitting at the bottom of a riverbed and water has been running over it, over it, over it for a long period of time and they've become smoothed out and they have less rough edges. Lots of people use river stones in their landscaping. So a rock like this can become a rock like this, nice and smooth by water running over it. You can see how um, Rocks. Actually, I'm going to do I'm going to do number two first, guys, and then I'll call on number one. Sorry, I'm out of order. Uh, so if my number two folks can come up, we can. There's an activity that you can do that can show you how rocks change over time. If you take a couple of rocks, now I have plastic in here to keep them from leaking, but we'll take it out. So this particular um, jar of water and rocks, I'm going to give to my friend here. And this particular jar of water and rocks, you can see the water's a little bit dirtier, I'm going to give to my friend um, on the end. And this one I'm going to put in the middle. So to do this activity, um, actually let's go out in front of the counter. To do this activity you take the three jars. This jar needs to be shaken a thousand times. So a thousand good shakes, and I've been shaking that for a couple of days, so go ahead and shake that up. This jar is shaken a hundred times. Go ahead and shake your jar. And this one only ten, so make sure you count. All right. You can stop because I've been shaking it too. All right, so if you hold your, pa your plastic back, can you see that in this jar the water is still very clear? There's not been a lot of weathering and breaking up of the rock. In this jar, we start to get some sediment 
floating around in the jar. You start to see little pieces of rock. The reason that the rock is cloudy is because little particles of the rock have been worn away, both by the water and by the other rocks hitting them. And then look at this jar, a thousand tops, and you see that after a while, those, jar, those rocks are really going to start to break up. And if I strain this and looked at the rocks, you'd see they'd have smoother edges than the rocks in this one. Thanks, guys. You can take those back over there. We'll get them from you later. So in addition to the water hitting the rocks and wearing them down, smoothing them out, the other part of that is that the rocks in the water hit other rocks. So if I can have my number one friend up here. Thanks. So to see how rocks hitting other rocks help break them down, you can do this. You can put sugar cubes in a peanut butter jar. Um, make sure that um, you, you know, don't do it too far in advance. You don't want them to get too moist. But as he shakes that up, give it some good shakes. As he shakes that up, you can see how the rocks hitting the other rocks are going to wear them down and start to make them break apart. Do you see all those little pieces in there? So that's what happens when rocks in a stream or anything else, when they collide into each other, they also help break each other up. Great, thanks. All right. Another way that rocks can break down is by wind. We have something called wind erosion. We see wind erosion a lot in places where there's not a lot of trees because the wind blows through and hits the rocks and essentially wears them down. You can also see wind erosion in places where there's a lot of sand. Essentially, sand is rock. In places where you have sand, the kind of rock is a sandstone. One of the things that we'll study when we study rocks and minerals is that all rocks are made up of different combinations of chemicals. And in the places where you have a lot of sand, like the deserts and things like that, the rock is made up primarily of something called sandstone. And we call it that because when it breaks down, it becomes sand. So one of the ways that sand can be weathered or stone can be weathered by sand is the wind. So where's my friend uh, number three assistant? You can come right behind the counter here. Awesome. So what she's going to show you is that as the wind goes across the sand, if you can just turn that on, there you go. It's going to blow. Now the sand's a little moist. It's a little uh, humid here in Brockton, Massachusetts, so it may not blow it as much as I'd like. If you're going to do this activity, make sure you dry your sand out really well. But what happens is that the sand, the wind will blow the rocks blow against the rock, break it up, and it's not the wind itself that's breaking it up, but it's the tiny little particles in the wind of the other sand. I have an animation that's going to show you how um, water and sand in a third way break up rocks. So let's look at that and you'll see that a little bit better in the animation. Thanks. Sorry about that. So here we've got rocks and the pebbles and pieces of sand that are in the wind are wearing down the rocks, weathering it, breaking it apart, little pieces. The action of the waves hitting the rock are breaking it down and weathering it. Plus there's other pebbles and small pieces of particles that are also brushing up against the rock as the water hits it. And then there's this piece that we call um, ice wedging. So when it rains and there's cracks in the rock, you can see that the water fills in those cracks. If it gets cold enough, that water freezes, and as water freezes, it expands and basically pushes out against the rocks and breaks it into more pieces. The force of the expansion breaks it up. So those are three ways to physically weather rock. All right. So that first way of weathering rock we said was water, the second one was wind, and that third way that you saw in the animation was something called ice wedging. And ice wedging is a really specific way of breaking down rock that happens a lot in cold climates. There's a cool activity that you can do to simulate ice wedging and see how it works. It requires plaster of Paris um, and um, some sort of cardboard container like a milk container and a balloon that's got about this much water in it, you know, about the size of a golf ball. All right. So what you want to do is you want to mix your plaster of Paris with water until it has the consistency of um, pancake syrup. Um, don't do it too far in advance or you get this. 
So you want to make sure that you do it when you need it. Um, so we're going to add water to the Plaster of Paris. If you've not seen Plaster of Paris before, it's really easy to get. Uh, it, it comes in uh, boxes like this at Walmart. Um, and you can get it from art supply places and things like that. So you mix it up till it's the consistency of pancake syrup. A little runny, a little lumpy. And then you pour it into your cardboard carton. Like that. All right. Then what you do with the balloon is you sink the balloon into the plaster Paris all the way down so that none of the balloon is showing except the little piece at the top the, where you tied the knot. And you sink it down. You see this one I didn't tie in as far as I should have. And what happens is this. You're going to let it sit just long enough to set so that it doesn't rise back up. And then put the whole thing in the freezer. All right, put it in the freezer while the plaster of Paris is still setting, while it's still loose. You stick the balloon in there, put the whole thing in the freezer. You should also do one that doesn't have a balloon and put them in the freezer at the same time. Why do we want to do one that doesn't have a balloon and, and put it in the freezer at the same time? This is our what? Our, you can say it, go ahead. I told you not to, but go ahead and say it. It's our control, right? Um, this, is the, this is what we're going to see, well, what should happen, what did happen. Now, what should happen when you pull it out of the freezer is that the water in the balloon is going to expand, right? Because when water freezes, it expands. And when it expands, it's actually going to make cracks in the plaster of Paris. So this is um, no balloon, and this, you can see some of the cracks here. The reason this didn't work as well as I would have liked was because too much of the balloon was sticking up through the top. And what's going to happen? Where is the expansion going to go if it's not all the way down in the plaster of Paris? It's going to go up, right? Path of least resistance. So you want to make sure that the balloon as, is as almost all the way submerged, and you want to make sure you put it in the freezer before the plaster of Paris completely sets so that the, the balloon expanding affects the plaster, plaster of Paris and cracks it. So that's a really fun activity that you can do to investigate ice wedging and see how ice wedging works. All right. So after the rock is broken down, we've got it broken down, we're breaking down our rock here, all right? The next part of the process is the pushing or moving around of the particles. And we call that pushing or moving around of the particles erosion. Erosion is different than weathering, although many people group them together because the two processes often happen together. So let's look at our essential questions about erosion. What do we mean or what does erosion mean? And what are the main ways that erosion occurs? All right, so let's bring our sand back for a second. Erosion means to move, move particles. So when the particles are broken up, the rocks, the water breaks up the particles. It then pushes them along. In the case of the ocean, pushes them along. The sand gets caught up in the waves and it pushes it along. The reason we have a beach is because all of the rock that has been broken out along the ocean line and even the rocks in the bottom of the ocean have been beat up and they get pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed to the shore and then they sit there and then that is what forms the beach. So water is one thing that can help push particles along. Wind also, again, when you're talking about out in the desert, when the wind breaks the rock down, it's going to push it along. And then ice also can push particles along. So I have here a simulation, if you will. I'm going to stick this under here, of a glacier. So my fun putty that's up at the top is meant to be a glacier or ice. I'm going to tilt it in a second. But what I did was I built a, uh, a path for it to go. So many, many, many years ago, we had much more ice on the surface of the earth than we do now. And when that ice started to melt and move south due to gravity, it, it kind of cut holes in the rock. And I'm going to show you that in a second. Um, in addition to cutting holes in the rock, it also dragged pieces of rock and dirt with it. And that's the erosion piece. So I'm going to remove the dam, if you will, and I'm going to show you what it looks like as the ice flows down into the valley. Hopefully it should flow. It's been sitting here a while. It flows down into the valley, and as it flows, it's going to pick up 
Come on, flow. Like I said, it's a little humid here. Um, as it flows, it's going to pick up the, the sand and the rocks. And essentially, if I could pick up an iceberg, it would look like that underneath. And it just drags that rocks and sand with it down the valley and in the end at the bottom deposits them, melts, and then you have all that rock and sand at the bottom. You can also look at that by actually looking at ice. Now where did I put that? Oh, here it is. So I took that same milk carton that I had before and I froze a block of ice. So here's my block of ice. Okay, you can take that block of ice and some clay and just imprint it into the ice, into the clay rather, to see what would happen to the rock as the ice moved down. You could see that it would cut the rock and smooth it out. And that's how large canyons, one of the ways that large canyons are formed. The other thing you could see is that as the ice moves down, we'll take this silly putty out of here and we'll actually use the ice. As the ice slides down, it's going to pick up all of that sand and rock and slide it and move it along with it as it slides down the canyon and basically cut a path through the rock and that's how sometimes when you look at canyons that you see the stripes and the bands in the side what's happening is that the ice is moving down and cutting into the rock dragging the rocks with it and things like that all right I know my hands are really dirty but that's okay we will make do all right so let's take a look at this picture This is a picture of something called Snake River Canyon. And Snake River Canyon is, uh, started out as a smaller river. And what happened was, over time, at periods of high rain, when the river overflowed over its banks, um, it would erode the soil away from the sides and carry it down and make a bigger, deeper river. And that's what happens a lot of times as rivers mature. They um, become deeper and wider as, they er as the soil erodes away from the sides of the river. One of the biggest things that we want to deal with that we want to talk about is soil erosion. Soil erosion is a big problem because it um, moves too much soil, the soil isn't where it's supposed to be, and then there's problems where the soil ends up. Soil erosion occurs when the water rains on an area where you have just plain old soil and it washes the soil away. So where are my, I guess it's my number four assistant, if you will. All right, so this is an example, come on over here, you stand there for a second, I guess. This is an example of how you can make your own stream table and soil erosion demonstration and activity. Just get a big plastic box or you can even use a small box and do small erosions. And I put holes in the bottom here. Now it's important to put holes here and not on the bottom. And the reason is we're trying to look at the soil and the water that runs off the top, not necessarily what seeps through. So we want to get the stuff that runs out these holes. So if you could hold this for me, you're going to be my erosion catcher. Okay? All right. So I'm going to come in and I'm going to rain down on in here, like my friend Jimmy Fallon likes to say. And what we're going to see when we allow it to rain in here is that eventually what happens if there's too much rain, the water and the soil and everything gets washed down the slope and we get a lot of dirt and sediment and water that's just raining right down. So that kind of erosion can be a problem uh, as well. All right, we're gonna, hmm, that might drip for a little while. Didn't consider that. Let's do this. Let's put it on the floor right underneath. Can you put it on the floor right underneath? We'll catch it all. We'll clean it up. We'll make a mess. We're gonna make a mess down in here. All right, thanks. All right, you can have a seat. All 
right, we can see this process of soil erosion, wind erosion, and uh, ice erosion better by looking at the fundamental our changing earth. So let's take a look at that. Okay, so this is the fundamental our changing earth, and we can choose to explore several different things, but we're going to look at earth's changing surface for right now. And let's see what this has to say. Nothing on Earth's surface lasts forever. Even the rocks are broken down over time. Drag a word from the left to the empty green box and then drag a word from the right to the empty red box. What changes? Try another pair of words. So we've been talking about erosion. So if I take erosion here, let's look at erosion by water. And you can see, again, that as the water runs over the rocks at the bed of the rivers or, or under the ocean, the movement of the water carries away pieces of rock. Let's look at erosion by wind. Same thing here. Remember that the wind has tiny pieces of rock in it that's beating up um, the, the larger pieces of rock, but it's also going to carry those pieces of rock away and then continue to beat up other pieces of rock. So dirt and sand and soil and pebbles, if the wind is strong enough, can all get pushed around and moved around by the wind. And then ice, remember we said about the glaciers. So the glaciers, as they move across and slide downhill, will pick up pieces of rock and and of course beat up other pieces of rock and wear them down that's the weathering piece and then they continue to drag that rock with them as they move downhill thanks all right so you could see in that activity that the um, wind and the rain and the water and the ice all move things around. But then what happens when they're done moving them around and they end up somewhere? What happens to the sand on the side of a riverbed um, or at a beach when it builds up? What happens to the rocks and the sediment at the end of a glacier when the glacier's done moving? What happens when a river empties out into um, a, a place, a, a bigger, larger ocean, a freshwater river empties out into a, a freshwater ocean and it had all this sediment with it? Where does that sediment, where do those paint particles, where does that dirt end up? Well, that is called deposition. So we have a slide that has the definition for deposition. Deposition is the building up of the sand, the rocks, the particles, the dirt, after it's been eroded from someplace. And we see this in lots of places. We see piles of dirt, piles of sand. Um, there are certain landforms that are specifically formed from deposition. So the landform that's a fan-shaped landform that's formed when a river dumps out into a so uh, an ocean is called a delta. And you can see that um, when you look at certain areas where they have those. The, the landforms, the bridges that are formed out in the ocean when sand doesn't quite make it to the beach but it builds up right at the way where the waves break, you know, those are called sand bars and we see those. And the same thing with the glaciers, all of the dirt and rocks that end up at the bottom of the glacier where the glacier was and then the glacier melts and you've got a pile of rocks and dirt left there, that's called a moraine. So there's all kinds of landforms that are formed from deposition. One of the um, most important effects or um, one effect that we see from deposition that happens a lot is with rivers. So what happens when you have a river is that it starts out, like we said earlier, uh, long and straight. But then over time, as the water, for one reason or another, takes a different path, it starts to deposit that sand around curves. And those curves build up and build up and build up. So we can tell how old a river is based on how many what they call meanders or curves it has. So let's look at um, a exploration that we have called the ever-changing river that's going to demonstrate this process. Okay, so we said before that as rivers get older, they get deeper and wider as they scrape along the sides of the path that they're going and pull soil farther down the river. Let's see what happens as that soil builds up and rivers change over time. So we've got four situations here. After years of erosion by running water, the river has created a wide valley 
and its river's course is more curved. As the river changes course, it left small river segment cut off. The years of erosion have caused the river to meander in many different directions. It has widened the river valley even more, and the river is deep and runs fast. So we need to put these in order. So we're going to start with this one. The river is deep and runs fast. That's a young river. And then as it ages, it gets wider by erosion. We've already talked about that. And then here we've got years of erosion have caused the river to meander. And that word meander just means to make those curves. And then as those curves, um, the sediment builds up on those curves, we get um, little places where it's cut off. So let's just watch this animation really quick and see how that works. So this is the Young River. And as the river gets wider, pulls away soil, um, it gets faster and deeper, like we talked about earlier. And then what starts to happen is um, the water will start to go um, in a different path and leave sediment along these curves. And then eventually, even what happens is so much sediment gets deposited that you get a break off. And we call this little piece over here an oxbow lake. And that is um, when you have oxbow lakes, you know that it's an older river. So let's recap what we've learned so far about these processes. Weathering means to break down, wear down rock. Erosion means to carry the weathered particles away. And deposition means to have the particles build up somewhere and often that means it's going to make a new landform. Here's another picture for you to look at. Take a look at this picture. Can you see in this picture where the wind has weathered the rock up at the top? See how flat it is? So that wind has come straight through and literally worn it out flat. Can you see where the wind has eroded the sand? So the wind has to picked up those particles and carried them away. So that's not a pile of sand on top of the rock, it's flat. And can you see where the wind has deposited the sand? In the piles at the base of the uh, little mountain there, it's called a butte actually, but at the base of the little mountain there you could see piles of sand that have been deposited. So in this one picture you can see all three processes, weathering, erosion, and deposition. The picture also shows another force that changes the earth that we haven't talked about a lot, and that's gravity. Gravity also causes erosion simply because every once in a while if it rains too much and things get too weak they can't stay where they are anymore and they fall down. Mudslides, rock slides and those kinds of things are things that happen due to a lot of water sometimes, rock slides not so much, but weathering and erosion. They can be very dangerous and they cause damage to properties. We want to kind of prevent the mudslides, the rock slides, and the erosion of soil. So we already showed what happens when you have just plain soil. So what are the things, scientists and engineers do a lot of studying to try to come up with ways to keep the soil from eroding. Um, landscapers and things like that, they don't want, you don't want to spend a lot of money for, um, to landscape your yard and then have it all wash away. So we try to do different things. So this is an experiment you could do. You could either do it with the big box or you can do it with the smaller boxes. Okay? So first you do it with the, just the plain soil. Then we're going to look at what happens if we plant plants instead. So why would we want to plant plants? Well, plants have roots. Right? What's the function of a root? The function of a root is to do what? Absorb water to feed the plant, right? So the plants have a lot of roots, and if they have a lot of roots, then what we can, what, what happens is when it, water, when the water comes, you can, um, the, it basically absorbs the water and keeps the water from running off the top. So sometimes landscapers and scientists think that planting plants will help. So if I can get one of my helpers here, over here, you can stand right here on the corner. And what we can do is we can do the same thing that we did before with the just soil, but now we're going to do it with 
plants. And you can see whether or not you get a lot of erosion, whether or not a lot of soil comes out or just water. And basically, you can investigate with different kinds of plants, different kinds of roots. And even, if I can get my other helper here, you can step aside there, take that with you. Thanks. How about grass? So one of the reasons why landscapers and, and folks plant a lot of grass on hills is to keep the soil from eroding um, and wearing out. So again, you could do the same activity, except this time now you've got grass, which has lots and lots of roots. You can see how the roots hold the soil when you look over here. Okay? All right. You want to take that for me? And just take it back to your seats and we'll get that from you later. Thank you, assistants. All right. We have a lab in Discovery Education called Here Today, Gone Tomorrow. And the premise of the lab is that there's a park and a whole hillside has been washed out. And you want to investigate how to prevent that from happening again. So let's take a quick look at what this lab Here Today, Gone Tomorrow looks like. Here's the situation. We've got a park and a whole big hill in the park has been washed away. So just eroded away and they don't want that to happen again. So they're asking us to help them when they replace the hill, what should they do to keep the, the soil from eroding? So we're going to go into the lab here and see what we can do about that. Okay. We're going to do level one. Of course, you could explore level two um, in your class. Here are our variables. Soil treatment, in other words, what are we doing to the soil? How high the water flow is and the incline. So maybe one of the things that the uh, park people can do when they replace the hill is to level it out a little and maybe the soil won't run off so much. Or maybe what they can do, like we said earlier, plant some plants or do something to the soil to keep it from running. I don't know that they can uh, they can really um, do anything about the amount of water because that's really going to be about rain and they can't control the rain. Let's um, set amount of water to medium and let's set incline to medium and investigate the possibilities of different soil treatments. So here we go. Let's simulate some rain coming. Here comes the rain on our hill and you can see over here the water is running down our um, little incline here and we get seven liters of soil erosion so that's a lot of erosion all right and let's go back in here now and change that to adding some plants so now instead of just the plain soil we're gonna plant some plants um, we've done this with the hands-on activity already so I think we have already talked about what we should see happen and we do look we went from seven uh, liters of soil erosion to four liters of soil erosion and then the last option instead of plants is to deal, build um, horizontal trenches so that the water kind of falls into these little gullies and has time to be absorbed down instead of running down. So let's see if maybe that's a better answer than the plants. So we'll go ahead and hit go. Here comes the rain. And we're looking at it and I think that it's better than nothing we have six instead of seven liters but the plant still seems to be the best option so we could go back in and we could um, investigate plants at low medium and uh, steep inclines and see what's the best way to replace this hill and prevent so erosion, especially soil erosion, can be a problem. It can cause problems in landscaping, it can cause problems in, in hill, whole hillsides getting washed out. And more importantly than that, in some areas, it's not so much that the soil is eroding, but it is the fact that um, where is the sediment going? So if you happen to live in an area where there's a large lake, let's say, all of that sediment that's washing down the hillside is ending up in the lake. And that can cause a problem in the environment of the lake. 
One, some of the things that we do to prevent soil erosion in addition to plants, and you saw that you can dig trenches, is to cover the soil with like landscaping rocks or to put down mulch. So the mulch will help absorb the water and keep the soil from running down the hill. So lots of times when you see these things on people's lands, grass, plants, landscaping rocks, mulch, the purpose is to prevent the soil erosion. All right, but in addition to erosion being troublesome, sometimes it can be deadly. Ooh, let's look at this next picture. So this is a sinkhole, and sinkholes happen when we have soft earth underneath harder layers of earth. Often it happens at roads because we put down tar over softer rock, and what happens is the rock underneath erodes away and leaves a big space. And now you've got literally a road over nothing, and when the cars and the trucks and things drive over it, Eventually, too much mass, too much weight, and you get a hole in the ground. You can illustrate or see how a sinkhole is formed with this demonstration. So I need my, my last assistant, right? Come on up. So what I did here is I took a couple layers of sugar cubes, there's our sugar cubes again, and stacked them up to represent the softer rock underneath the road and uh, around the top and the sides is clay to represent the tar that we would put down to be the road. So come on in if you can and what I'm going to ask you to do while I hold it is I want you to rain on that as hard as you can with that water. All right and go ahead keep going. It's all right. What's going to what you can see what will happen and of course we would have to leave that for a little bit but eventually what happens as the water gets in underneath It'll wear down the sugar cubes and eventually what happens is what you have is a big hole in here and with nothing but road on top of it. And that's how a sinkhole forms. And then if a truck came along and happened to get a crack, a weakness in that surface, then the next thing you know, truck's going to fall through and might not be very good for the truck driver or the car driver or anybody else. I've seen whole houses go down in sinkholes. I've seen uh, lots of things go down in sinkholes. And so now there you go. Um, can you do me a favor? Can you, um, there's a bucket over there. So as we um, allow that water to sit, now when I pour that water off, now I've got road but no rock underneath it. And that's how essentially weathering and erosion causes sinkholes. Kind of scary, wouldn't you say? All right, thanks, have a seat. All right, so whether it's dramatic like a sinkhole or something that happens over a long period of time like the flattening of a rock or the changing of a river, weathering, erosion, and deposition happens all the time. Sometimes, like in the spring, more than others because of lots of rain, um, but it, hap it's, it occurs all the time. We've got one last activity that we want to do with you, and I'm going to ask all of my helpers to come up. And this is called the Snickers activity. So now before you do this activity in your classroom, make sure there's no peanut allergies because there's peanuts in Snickers, right? But it's a sweet little activity. What you do is you take a bite-sized Snicker, and all my friends in the room have a bite-sized Snicker, and you put it in your mouth. So go ahead and put it in your mouth while I talk about what happens. Do not bite it or move it around. Just allow your mouth to kind of melt the soil, the first layer. So your mouths are doing the weathering right now. Your mouths are doing the erosion. What's, what's the erosion? The erosion is the swallowing of the chocolate, right? What do you feel underneath the chocolate? It's the peanuts, right? Underneath the chocolate is the peanuts, that's the rocks. And now, in order to break up those rocks, you have to do a little bit more stronger weathering. So now, you have to use your teeth and mechanically break those rocks up. So go ahead and chew. All right. Oh, you're not there yet? All right, you keep weathering. Um, all right, chew those rocks up. And then underneath the rocks is another layer of thicker, heavier, in the case of the Snickers, it's caramel, right? But thicker, heavier, denser rock that needs even more chewing and more weathering, right? The way you just weathered and eroded that Snickers is the way rocks are weathered and eroded on Earth all the time. 
We hope that you learned some really great stuff today about weathering, erosion, and deposition. You can find the archive of this lesson as well as the lesson plans we wrote to go along with them at our wiki. And they're going to put up the link for the wiki, but it's essentially deseasonalsciencestream.wikispaces.com. This is our last webinar, our last live stream for the school year. We'll be back in September. So watch your emails for our first live stream of the new school year in September and join us to learn even more from the Discovery Education Science Tech Book. Coming to you live from Brockton, Mass. We thank you for coming. Have a great day. Woo!